So hello everyone again. Um, my name is Katrina Heinova and I'm with Brian Research and Engineering. We are the developers and providers of a simulation software Promax. And here you can see us smiling in front of the office in the US. So we do have three offices around the world, one in the US in a city called Bryan. And then we do have office in Brno, Czech Republic, and then in Singapore. And I'm actually calling to you from the Brno office uh, in Czech Republic. It's in the middle of Europe. So today, what we are going to cover is um, membrane separation. Today, we'll talk about a membrane technology. So I'll give you some overview of um, what the, what's the current status of membrane technology. Uh, then we'll move on to modeling the membrane separation in Promax, and we'll look at both one-stage system and two-stage membrane systems. So you can have a look at how to incorporate the membrane separation with the rest of your simulation. So let's first answer the question, what is actually a membrane? Uh, it's basically a discrete uh, thin interface that moderates the permeation of chemical species which are in contact with it. And today we'll specifically talk about gas separation using membranes. So what's happening there is that gas mixture is at high pressure and it's passed across the surface of a membrane. And that membrane is selectively permeable to one of the components of the feed mixture. So that one goes to the permanent side and we have the rest in the retin tape. This equation over here on the right hand side, that's very important. Uh, that's what's showing as the flux of the gas. So the J-I stands for flux of the gas I, uh, and it is defined as the volume that will travel through a specified area of the membrane uh, per unit of time. As you can see in the formula, it is determined by permeability of the gas. That's the big big P, and then um, the thickness of the membrane, that's uh, the L down here. And then obviously very important is also the difference in partial pressure between the feed side and the permeate side, because that's the driving force which keeps, uh, keeps the flow going. Permeability of a component <clears throat> is very much dependent on uh, the membrane, uh, but also on operating conditions. I want you to keep uh, that in mind. A unit, common unit for uh, permeabilities is barrier. And um, if you want to know what's the definition of this barrier unit, you can see here on the slide. However, uh, oftentimes in industry, Permeability is actually not the most suitable parameter used in practice. What we often use is a term called permens, which is actually pressure normalized flux. So if you look at the formula, it's basically the permeability divided by the thickness. And it is more commonly used uh, as it describes a membrane module rather than the material, because it's very difficult, you know, sometimes to assess uh, the thickness of the membrane. Most commonly used units for permanents are so-called uh, GPU, gas permeation units. And again, you can see the definition uh, here on the slide. What's very important is actually the ratio of the permeabilities, and that's so-called selectivity. So selectivity will be ratio of permeabilities of different components. Ideally, what you like to have is a membrane which has 
high selectivity for the component that you want to remove, that you want to send to the permit side, and also high permeability, because that leads to a higher flow per square meter of the membrane area. So high selectivity and high permeability would be the ideal. However, these two are often, they have often reverse relationships. So it's, it's quite challenging to find a membrane which would have both high selectivity and high permeability. Because the membranes usually require very large surface areas, you know, it could be thousands of square meters, the membrane modules are usually shaped um, in such a way that the surface area to volume ratio is as high as possible. So oftentimes you will see the membrane being rolled up to sheets into some spiral wound membranes, or you would create so-called hollow fibers. So there are different types of um, the shapes you can find them in. Now let's uh, discuss a bit about the applications membranes can be, can be used for. So the first large scale commercial application of membrane um, gas separation was the separation from, or was the separation of hydrogen from nitrogen in uh, ammonium reaction. So if you have ammonia plant, you have a purge gas, which still contains uh, some hydrogen, so you would like to separate that hydrogen from the purge gas stream. Second application for hydrogen separations uh, could be you could have sele hydrogen selective membranes uh, for recovery of hydrogen from waste gases, which are produced in refinery operations. And it could also be used to correct uh, the ratio of hydrogen and carbon monoxide in syngas production. Why was hydrogen separation the first application? It really is because uh, hydrogen is a small molecule, it doesn't, it's non-condensable, and it's actually highly permeable compared to some of the other gases. And you can see that in the table below, you can see that the selectivity of hydrogen over some other components is quite, uh, quite high. And you can also see some of the different uh, materials you can have for membranes. So that's hydrogen separation. As I said, that's kind of the first large scale application. A second, second application, which you can see being used in industry, is production of nitrogen from air. It can be done using membranes, and this technique would be used specifically for smaller nitrogen plants. Uh, you would not see it for, uh, for huge uh, nitrogen plants, because that would not be really um, economical. But for smaller ones, uh, it, it is used. What you can see in the table is that specifically for oxygen nitrogen separation, there is a very, very strong inverse relationship between the flux, so between the permeability and the selectivity. Because as you can see here, the materials which have very high permeabilities have quite a low selectivities. And once we are getting to more selective membranes, the permeability is not that well. So specifically for air separation, you will often see designs which use one or two or three step membranes um, so that you can really achieve the high purity of nitrogen because usually you want to achieve around 99%. Other application, and that's one of the applications we will focus most at uh, in our practical part is natural gas separation and namely carbon dioxide separation. So when using the membranes to remove carbon dioxide, you want to be sending the carbon dioxide to the permeate side. 
because that way you minimize the recompression cost you would have to recompress the retin the you know the gas you actually want to achieve for carbon dioxide separation as you can see in the table um, usually cellulose acetate or polyimid membranes are used and you can have designs which use uh, one stage that would usually be just for small gas flows because you will actually see that you get quite a high methane your product losses into the permanent side so more commonly you will see two stage designs where the permit is recompressed it's passed through a second membrane and that help us reduce the methane losses and don't worry that's one thing we will look at uh, when we simulate it in chromats so just in a minute uh, you can see here there are some nitro gas separations other than that i mean you can have um, dehydration however that's not that common usually for dehydration we would just use glycol dehydration but you know if you have some small gas stream or if you have an offshore platform where for some reason you cannot um, install glycol column you might use membrane and also for dew point adjustments or um, propane plus recovery but those are not that common i would say all right, so that was kind of, let's say, more theoretical intro, just so everyone is kind of on the same speed of uh, on what membrane is and how does it work. Now we'll look at how to model membrane uh, in Promax. So since Promax 5 uh, was released last year in February, uh, we introduced membrane block. So now you can find a membrane block within the other shapes uh, in Promax. And as you can see here on the picture, membrane block will always require at least one stream. So the feed stream always has to be there and two process outlet streams. So the retentate side and the permate side. You can also connect a sweep stream uh, to represent uh, the sweep gas which you're introducing into your membrane but that as it says here it's optional so we do have an option to connect it but it's not compulsory so at this point what i'm actually going to do i'm going to go out from my presentation and i'm going to enter promax so what we're looking at uh, at this moment is just a single membrane stage we are feeding a gas which has almost 15% of CO2. And our goal would be to remove the CO2 uh, to achieve the usual pipeline CO2 specification of 2%. So in the retentate, in the end, we would like to have 2%. At this moment, I'm really just modeling the streams around the membrane. But uh, what you always have to pay attention to is that your feed should be pretreated. And when I say pretreated, I mean, uh, you should make sure that all solids are removed because solids could plaque the membrane. That liquids, the free liquids are removed because also free liquids could destroy your membrane. And you should also make sure that actually throughout the operation of the membrane that you are not going to be forming any liquids, okay? So that you don't have any condensation in the membrane. So usually some pretreatment is required up front. Um, it might be that you will have a molecular sieve there. Uh, it, you will probably have some carbon bed. You will probably have uh, some cooling and then separation and then superheating in front of the membrane just to make sure that the feed is well treated and later on i'll show you how you can check in promax for the dew point temperatures for example so membrane block can be found under promax auxiliary objects so here in the shapes if you go to auxiliary objects 
you can see membrane separator block here. When I open the block, and you will notice there are a couple uh, things. First, connections is showing you what streams you have connected. On process data, that's where we are specifying uh, the operating conditions, so pressures, uh, what's the area of the membrane, and so on. And then there is this important tab, which is called selectivities. And on the selectivities tab, that's where you actually define your permeabilities, or rather say permanences. As you can see, I have already done that for most of my components. So you see that I have defined uh, select permeabilities for components like methane, ethane, and so on. So for the constituents of my gas, but I have not done that yet for CO2 because that's what I want to demonstrate. So if you want to add a new permeability, uh, what you do is you hit add and you'll notice that a new column appeared here. It's nice to give it a name so you can change the name to whatever you want. Uh, then you choose the component. So here in the list, I can see all the components present in my environment. And then I have a choice. Either I choose a membrane type from our library. So we do have a library of some membrane types uh, together with their permanences, permeabilities, or you can supply your own values. So if you know the constants for the membrane you're working with, you can just supply the values into the tool. I'm going to show you both options. So imagine that you want to use the library data. So what you do is here in the membrane type, you will select what is the, what is the type of the membrane. So what's the material? So let's imagine we are using a cellulose acetate membrane. That was one of the first ones to be used for CO2 removal. We also have to choose a membrane type reference. What that actually stands for is it's going to indicate from which, which reference, and in this case, we mean from which uh, patent are we taking those values. So you see that, for example, for cellulose acetate, we do have three different data sets available. So there are three different patents uh, available with, uh, with this data. So let's imagine I'm going to use the, this one, this reference middle one. Once I do that, it will populate the permeability values here. And you will see it will tell me that in this patent, there is a um, certain permeability. Some patents, they have, let me try some other patent, but some patents, they do have a range of uh, values. So they also show you what's the maximum number and minimum number. So they will populate the numbers uh, for you. If you're wondering how to get some more information about the patents, I will just copy a link to the chat. This is a link to a website where you can search through, uh, through the patents. So imagine that uh, I'm, and I'm just going to pull it to my second screen for a minute. So my patent number is 5482539. Okay, so I have put it, put that in, and then I do search. And it's going to uh, show me the document uh, it found. So you can have a look at what, what does this patent say, you know, maybe what are the conditions it was prepared at, and so on. So this is for you to find some uh, references.
all of the data for the different patents, so the library with the different numbers, is accessible for anyone with Promax installed. I'll show you how. If I want some more, inf more details on this. If you're a user of Promax, you already know that uh, if you hit F1, it's always going to open help page, which is relevant to what you're looking at. So now it opened a help page, which is talking about membrane separator specifications. And I can have a look at what does it say about selectivities. And there is a sentence here. The data for the membrane type and membrane type reference selections may be found in the membrane data XML file. And then you can click and have a look at more details about this file, how to access it, how to possibly add some values if you want. Uh, so I strongly recommend you if you want to have a look at the whole list of data we have in our library, uh, go to this help page and have a look at the XML file. Uh, read through this if you have any questions and need some help with working with the file let me know i'll be happy to help you all right so we have chosen our uh, membrane type and membrane type reference we got some permeability uh, values and if i make this permeability active you see it's going to report the permeability constant and this is the important one for us this is the one Promax will calculate with if you chosen a reference which would have a different value for maximum and minimum permeabilities uh, the constant over here would be an average number okay so the library data can really give you a nice guidance but of course if you do have data for your specific membrane. If you have data from vendor, uh, from your membrane vendor on what are the permeabilities, I really recommend you to use those values. And it's very easy to do uh, basically, and I did it for all the other selectivities. I would delete this and here in my permeability constant, I would just put the number and I'm going to say that my CO2 permeability constant is 100 GPU. If you have a lot of experimental data, you know, especially if you work with uh, in a laboratory which develops membranes and so on, and you have the data available, you can also express the permeability as a function of temperature, pressure and driving force. And that would be using these other constants here. Again, in our help, we do have, we do have the formula shown here. So you can have a look at how do we calculate the permeability constant dependency on those parameters. Uh, so you can have a look, look over here and see how does it how does it affect the overall permeability all right so once i'm happy with my specification for the permeability constant i'll just make it active very easy now let's go to process data tab our feed stream if we look on the screen is coming at 70 bar cheese so at rather high pressure to achieve the separation, we need to have low pressure at the permeate side. So in the initial permeate pressure, that's where we will specify what is the pressure at the permeate. And in my case, I'm saying that at the permeate, I'm going to have initially right after the membrane two bar chi. There is going to be some pressure drop on the retentate side. So as the feed goes along the membrane, there's going to be some pressure drop. So let's assume it's going to be one bar. And we'll also have some small pressure drop over the permeate side. So 0.1 bar. Our flow configuration, there are four options for flow, uh, flow configurations. 
to best understand uh, what do we mean by that. Again, nothing easier than going to the help. And if you go to flow configuration, you can actually see here what do we mean by the different flow, flow configurations. So you see that, for example, in cross flow cases, this is how the flow is going. If you have a countercurrent flow, you see that the permeate flows concurrently to the feed uh, written tape side. So that's how you choose your, uh, your flow configuration. And the one I'm going to select, it's going to be the cross flow one. For temperature profiles, we also have a selection here. So you can select isothermal, adiabatic, or averaged. Again, in, here in the help, we do have a summary of what are the different temperature profiles. But just to sum it up very quickly, isothermal will basically, it's, that's the easiest one to, let's say, calculate. But basically, it will find the duty such that outlet temperature equals inlet temperature isothermal, right? Uh, the second option, adiabatic, uh, will basically find the outlet temperature such that we have adiabatic um, process. So basically, we will minimize or make zero, essentially, the enthalpy change from inlet to outlet. And then averaged temperature profile is also an adiabatic a process, but it's going to account for a countercurrent flow and the fact that there is a going there is going to be some heat exchange between the feed and retentate side and the permeate side. So actually, the permeate temperature will be set to sort of a midpoint between feed temperature and retentate temperature, and those temperature estimates are very important because as I mentioned, we have to make sure that we are not condensing any liquids in our membrane. So we have to be able to calculate what is going to be the temperature decrease as um, we go through the membrane. So for this example, I'm just going to say that the temperature profile is adiabatic. Now, module area, what that stays for, stands for, it's really how is the membrane sold? You know, module, as, the, as we all know the name, uh, that's basically some prefabricated part and, you know, it's, you, it's sold uh, by some area. So let's assume that my module area is 200 square meters. And now I have two options. Option number one is for me to directly specify how many modules do I have, okay? So let's say that I think I have five modules. That results in the total area of 1,000 square meters, right? And now I'm just going to execute the block. And what it will tell me is... With the five modules, with the 1,000 square meters, what am I able to achieve in the retentate? And you see that I was able to get CO2 down, but from 15 to 10%. So it looks like five modules is not enough. I could, of course, manually go and, you know, to try, okay, what happens if I use 10 modules? With 10 modules, I'm getting to 6.4%. You know, and I could go like that over and over. Uh, but instead, I could use the second option, how to use the membrane block. And that is, if I delete the module count and I go to selectivities, notice here you can set some constraints. And that's what I want, right? I want to find out how big my membrane has to be to achieve 2% of, uh, of CO2 in the outlet 
stream in the red setting. So my constraint target is 2%. The type is, in my case, written tape mall fraction. There are some other types you could use. The limit type is, in my case, upper limit. Okay, I need to be below 2%. So 2% is the maximum I can go to. And once I set my constraint, I again make it active. And now I hit execute. And now what it did is that you see my written date CO2 is below 2%. And I can go to process data. And I can see that to achieve that, my module count is 24. I need around 4,800 square meters. Okay, so I didn't have to iterate manually. Uh, I just set it up as a constraint and it gave me the area I need. We do have a question. Hi, I have a question. As per my understanding, membrane technology is proprietary by certain companies like UOP, Cameron for security bulk removal. Did, Pro did Promax is using general cellulose state membrane or is it using some company membrane as a reference for calculation? Very good question. So we do not have access to the proprietary selectivities uh, by those companies at this point. So the data you, you will find in our library are really publicly available data, as I said, from the, from the patents, for example, or from literature. So those are the ones you can access through our library. Now, of course, they are not going to be perfectly equal to the proprietary data uh, from the licensors, but they can at least give you a good, uh, good, good starting point, good first idea. If you are able to get the permeabilities uh, or some of those data from uh, the vendor you're working with, then what you can do, you can specify the constants yourself. Okay? So those are the two options uh, we have. Another question we've got is, what dew point margin is maintained at retentate to avoid condensation? Uh, very good question, and that's actually one thing I can I can show you at the mo at the at the moment. And this is also going to answer another question we got, we got, and that is what is hydrocarbons maximum can be in permate. So look, we we do have our inlet stream, right? And at this conditions, it's a vapor, but as the stream goes through the membrane, you can see that while here we had 40 degrees Celsius at our retentate side, we are going to cool it down to something below 30 degrees Celsius. In my case, I'm still in a vapor phase, so that's good. I haven't, uh, I haven't condensed anything. But we would always like to make sure that, you know, we have a margin between where we operate and where something could actually condense. So when you go into Pramax and you go to any stream, you can always create an analysis. And let me add uh, the one which is called freeze out hydrate H2O viewpoint. And let's hit OK. And if I hit solve, what I'll be able to see here is the water dew point. So at which temperature at this con cons composition would water start to, for start to form a liquid phase. I can also see at which temperature I could potentially form hydrates. So water dew point and solids formation temperature. We can also create this vapor pressure due bubble point analysis. And that one would help us 
estimate what is the total dew point temperature. So at which temperature do we start to form the first uh, liquid phase? And you see this actually equals to the water. So you can check those here. And as you see, actually in my case, I'm not really having a big margin on my inlet, right? I'm operating at 40 and I'm actually going to be forming uh, free water at 38. So I should have probably paid more attention to the pretreatment and I should make sure that um, I am going to be further from my u -bond. But let's actually check this for our retentate side, okay? Because that's actually the colder one, right? So let's make an analysis here for the dew point. And here we can see that the dew point temperature is actually quite low. It's very much lower than it was before. The reason is the composition. The retentate has a different composition than the feet, right? Because, I mean, CO2 was removed to the permate, but also water was very extensively removed to the permate side, right? So at the inlet, you see we had 0.13% of water in retentate. Uh, we have very low amount of water. If we can also look at permate side and look at the dew point uh, temperature here to make sure that that part is also safe. And you see that the dew point temperature is around 12 degrees while we operate at 29. So I would say safe. Uh, kind of a general recommendation. I would um, I would say is to superheat the inlet stream to at least 10 degrees above the dew point temperature. So I'm not really complying with that in my example here, but you know if the, if I was working on a real design, I would make sure that my concentration of water translated to my dew point temperature at the inlet is um, lower, okay? So that I can be sure that I'm in a safe region. And that's what a simulation can really help you with, right? Because it's very easy to find out what the dew point temperatures are at different compositions. So oftentimes, we're not really able to reach the required purity using a single step. And if you look at this particular example, the problem we have here is that our permate site contains a lot of methane. So you see that around 40% of the permate is actually methane, but we want the methane to actually be in the retentate site in, you know, in the gas product. Here in the permate, it's really just a waste. So we're not really happy with, uh, with that. So what we will do, we will use more uh, stages. And I'm going to go back to the presentation just for a quick, uh, quick moment. Multi-stage membrane applications are very common. And I have two examples here. Uh, one is for the air separation. So when we talk about oxygen nitrogen separation oftentimes the single step setup you can see up there is not the most ideal um, because your membrane area would just have to be really huge to achieve the 99% purity when you use the two step design you will actually be able to use lower or smaller membrane, even combined with the two stages. And that's because of the recycle stream you, you keep recycling. Eventually, this recycle stream will have lower concentration of oxygen 
than air has. And you can see the percentages up here. So that will actually help you to achieve more with, uh, less, uh, with less area. Of course, um, you can also go to three-step setup. So you see here, we do have three membrane, um, membrane parts. And again, the recycle streams are having higher concentration of nitrogen than the air has. Uh, one additional cost in this three-step design is the additional compressor. So you can, you, you can see that here we had to add uh, a second compressor. So that's when we have air separation. For the CO2 uh, separation we've, we've been talking about so far, you can see that with the one stage, uh, we will still have uh, quite a lot of methane in our permate. So we'll be losing a lot of methane. With the two-stage design where you take the permate side you compress it, uh, you adjust the temperature, you send it to a second separator where you actually get more uh, CO2 concentrated permate and you recycle the retentate stream back to the front where you mix it with the feed. With this uh, design, your losses of methane are going to be way lower. And we'll actually look at that. Uh, how do we do that in Promise? So let me go back to my simulation and let me just quickly add the other blocks we will need here. So we'll take the permate and we will compress it. So I need compressor. So the permate goes into the compressor. I do have an outlet stream from the compressor. I need energy stream for the compressor. Further, uh, we will need to cool down the gas because it was it will be at higher temperature after the compressor so i'm just quickly drawing this part and then we will need a second membrane block uh, i could go here to auxiliary objects and just pick the membrane separator but because this membrane separator already has all the selectivities set up in it and I just want to use the same, same membrane type um, as for my first stage. All I can just do is do control C and control V and then I'm going to flip um, this shape using control H and I'm going to connect it to my streams. So now this will be my permate side. This will be my retentate side. And the last thing I'm missing is a way how to actually send it back, how to recycle it back. So we do have an option to use recycles in Premax. So I'm going to put a recycle block here. I'm going to take a recycle outlet stream and I need one more thing and that's going to be a mixer. So I'm going to take a mixer to actually mix my inlet stream with my recycle and that's going to be mixed and sent to my membrane. All right, so that's, that's how you can just quickly add some of the some of the blocks. Now let's uh, look at how do they work. So our compressor will need to take the very low pressure permate and compress it 
to much higher pressure. It will have will work with some efficiency. So I'm going to say that this compressor has 70% efficiency. And I'll say that it needs to compress this to 71.5 bar G. The cooler uh, will need to cool it down to 40 degrees Celsius. And the cooler will have some small pressure drop. When I open my membrane, I'll be able to see that all the selectivities, all the permeability specifications, they stayed here. In this particular case for second stage, I'm not really targeting any, um, I'm not targeting any retentate CO2 composition. So I don't want to use uh, the constraint at this point. Instead, I'm just going to say that I have, for the second part, I have four modules. And again, my uh, pressure specifications and my temperature and so on, they will stay as for the first, first block. So you see that all these specifications, they stayed within the block when I just really simply did control C, control V. So that's uh, my separator. And then we have a recycle block, and that, that's about it. So anytime you have a recycle loop, the recycle loop is basically breaking the, breaking the loop, and it allows you to solve it. But what you as a user need to do, you need to provide an initial guess. And the initial guess always goes to the outlet stream of the recycle block. So what I would have to do is I would have to go into the stream six and basically fully specify it. I'm, if I don't have to do it manually, I won't. So what I will do is I will temporarily disconnect the stream. I will hit execute flow sheet. And you see that it's salted. It gave me some numbers into the stream six. Stream six, which leaves the recycle block, will always keep, will keep those numbers as the initial guess. Now I'm going to connect it. You see the stream stayed green. So that's, more, that's my initial guess. Now when I hit execute flow sheet, you will see that it will iterate. So it's going to iterate until the inlet stream to the recycle block and the outlet stream are uh, within a tolerance. Okay, so this is how you can model a two-stage uh, system. And we have a question in what operating scenario two-stage membranes are required. And my answer is when you really care about your methane losses. Because remember, and you can see it here, after the first stage, my methane is 40% from the stream. And if we look at total flows, if we look at mass flows, for example, I'm basically losing 2000 kilograms per hour, okay? Now in two state scenario, this is my waste stream, right? This is the stream which is leaving the loop. And in two-state scenario, the methane flow is 250, so 10 times lower losses, okay? And that's great, right? Because you want your methane to be in the retentate. So if you really care about your losses, uh, then the two-stage system is more applicable. And if we want to know the percentages, we can see that now in the waste stream, we have 8% of methane versus 4% after the first stage. This is our first shot, right? Uh, this is just the first shot of modeling two-stage system. Now, we could definitely optimize it. 
And one of the main parameters, one of the main parameters to optimize is the permate pressure after the first stage, because this pressure will have an effect on the total area of the membranes we need, on the compressor duty we will need, and on the methane losses as well. So how do we, how do we optimize it in Promax? We do have this great tool called Scenario Tool. And Scenario Tool can help you run parametric studies. To access the Scenario Tool, you can hit this Add Excel Workbook up here. That's going to add embedded Excel file. And within that file, if you go to Promax, there is the Scenario Tool option. I have already prepared the study I want to do. So what I want to study is how does the permeate pressure after stage one affect my compressor duty, my heat exchanger duty, uh, my, the number of modules I have to use in the stage one and the cubic meters of methane uh, I lose. So let's just very quickly put this scenario tool together. I'm going to do it very, very quickly, okay? And later on, I'm going to show you where you can find some very nice tutorials, which will really teach you step-by-step -step on how to create your own scenario tool. So I'm going to click scenario tool. I'm going to give this scenario tool a name. So I'm going to call it Permate Pressure Study. And now I'm going to define what are my inputs and outputs. So inputs are the parameters I'm going to change in the, in the model. So my input is my Permate Pressure. So I'll do add variable. I call this Permate pressure moniker will let me define what is the object within Promax I want to be changing. So if I hit select Promax object, we'll bring the, up this window. I know that the pressure is defined over here. So if I click on the stream, it will find a stream for me. And now I just go a little bit further and find out the pressure. Now you see, I cannot really select this one because what I actually did is I have specified the permeate pressure inside of the membrane block. So let's rather click on the membrane block. It will find a membrane block for me. And let's go to properties. And this is the one I'm searching for. Initial permeate pressure. Okay, that's where I defined in the simulation what my pressure at the permate site is. Once I click on it, it will bring me back to the window over here. It will show me the address of the object. You can kind of read it backwards. Then I select where does it look in, where should it look in Excel? So I just hover over these cell, cells and I see cell address correctly B4 to B13. It's good to always check the units that they correspond to whatever you like. And once you're happy with that, you will say, okay. Now let's do outputs. So I'll do add variable, I'll do compressor duty. I will do select Promax object. Now compressor duty is this one, is Q2. It's the energy rate. I'm going to make sure my units are whatever I want. I actually don't want them in kilowatts. I want it to be reported in megawatts, so I change this. And then I just, again, select the cells. I could go here and hover over the cells manually, or I can just hit this arrow and it will move it for me. 
and let's hit OK. Let's do this quickly for the others. Hate exchange of duty. That's the stream, right? And I want energy rate. I will shift this. I will change my units to megawatts. I'll hit OK. U to sum, that's going to be calculated inside of Excel. So other variable I need to define is number of module stages. So that will be modules in stage one. Select, click on membrane, found it, and my membrane properties module count. So as I'm saying, I'm going fast. If you worked with scenario tool, this is probably familiar with, with, for you. If you have not, this is to show you that once you get a little practice, it's very easy to build these. And I'll, as I said, I'll show you where you can learn how to do that. And last one I want to do is this uh, lost methane. So lost methane. Lost means it's going to be leaving with the spermate stream. And I want it just methane. So I'll go to composition. And I actually wanted the normal vapor volumetric flow of methane. So now I have all the necessary things defined. You see here that I have the option to run it from one to 10. And you see that's, that's what I really want, right? I have 10 runs. So nothing easier than just hit run now. And what it will do, it will take the, very, it will take the permeate pressure stage it will take the number, input it into the model, run the model, give me the results over here. And then once I, it gives me the results, it will automatically go to the second run. And I have, since this is Excel, you know, all of us, we know how to work with Excel. You can very easily uh, pre-configure a plot and it can be drawn for you automatically. So while this is solving, let me show you where you can find very good tutorials on how to build these. So if we go to our website, bre.com, we do have tutorials here and we do have them distributed in different groups And there are some uh, videos which really talk about scenario tool. So if you go to this basics group, I believe this is where we will have our scenario tool basics video. So the scenario tool basics video will walk you through how to create the scenario tool on your own. And while um, this is solving, you see we are already getting some interesting, interesting results. So as the permeate pressure of stage one increases, obviously the compressor duty goes down. That's understandable because now our compression compression ratio, you know. We are starting from a higher pressure, uh, so we are actually we actually need less less duty to compress it. The heat exchange duty also also goes also goes down. But what you might notice is here towards the end, and you can see it here in the in the figure as well. Actually. At some point, the 
the duty starts to increase. So even though your permit pressure is higher, you actually need more duty. Isn't that strange? I mean, it may sound, but what we haven't included in this study, what you cannot clearly see here, is that once your permit pressure starts to increase, you also will get higher flows, okay? And since you have higher flows, you know, you have higher volume of what you need to compress. At some point, your uh, compressor duty will actually be getting higher and higher. So that's why here you can see that actually operating at a permit pressure at around two and a half, three, so somewhere around here in this, in this bottom would probably be the best option. Obviously, the number of module stages you need to still achieve the 2% in your product, in your retentate stream from the first membrane stage, uh, goes up. So you see that the number of modules is, is increasing. So it's good to look at the both in the same figure because that can help you indicate how many um, or what's the permit pressure you should use. So it will be some kind of trade-off between the compressor duty and the number of modules. But that's what the scenario tool can help you really indicate uh, quickly. So those are some those are some of the points I wanted to cover with you. So we talked about what are the different membrane applications. Uh, we have discussed on how to use the membrane block within Promax and how you can actually incorporate that membrane block within a bigger simulation. So we looked at connecting it with its second stage with uh, the compressor. And we have looked at how do we conduct uh, some case studies using the scenario tool. All right, and we're getting some questions. As per our guidelines, this 8% still higher, this should be less than 3%. So obviously, I mean, everyone will have uh, different guidelines on how much methane can be, can be lost. It will definitely depend on what is your total flow of, um, of methane or of your gas. Because, you know, if it's lower flows, then 8% of lower flows is lower. So uh, you, might, you might get away with that. But uh, that always depends on many cases. And there are things we haven't optimized in this simulation. You might want to use more modules in the second membrane part, etc. So there is definitely room for optimization to get to your 3%. Another question we're getting, what is the minimum permit pressure can be achieved? As you've seen here, going to too low permit pressures will result in quite high compression duties and um, very much more difficult design of the compressor. So I would say not go below, definitely not go below one bar G. And as you see here, I would say anything below two and a half or two bar G is not really feasible. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, don't hesitate to contact us. If you have any questions, you can always reach us at support at bre.com. And we'll be happy to answer any of your questions.